Hey guys and welcome back to another YouTube video. In this video we'll be going through the round 2 game between St Kilda and Collingwood and reviewing it and why it was a crazy game in all and I'm not actually too worried about how my the plays I had went. I mean I did pick up Riley Bonner and he did go and score 61 which was a little bit poor but he had two quarters where he combined for three points and you know on another day against another side he probably makes that turns that into a really um an 80 85 and also Sinclair should be running more midfield time I would expect now with another winger going down for St Kilda meaning that their Zach Jones and stuff will play more wing time and so yeah I'm not too too worried about um about the role of Riley Bonner at the moment so yeah I'm, I thought it was a pretty good game. I thought Steele was back to his best, and that was what we were sort of expecting. But anyway, before we get into the video, let's uh, just you remember to like and subscribe. It's been crazy the last couple of days. I mean, I'm up to, what, 376 at the time of recording subscribers. And, I mean, just a week ago, I was at, like, 350 or something. So, yeah, huge growth in the channel and really liking that you guys are all getting behind it. So let's get into this recap and I'll try and make it between 10 to 15 minutes so it's not too long for you guys. Wangadeem Malira, what a player this guy is. 25, 36, 26 and 35. In the last quarter, he got the junkiest of junk ball that I've ever seen. He was just looking to get the pill. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, um, 7, 8 disposals in the last quarter. And I don't think, obviously, none of them are going to be contested or very few are going to be contested possessions. But yeah, he was just driving everything. I would have liked to have seen him switch it more to Bonner on the outside in the last quarter just to get some Bonner junk time. Um, but it didn't. It seemed like Collingwood were, for some reason, actually t switching on in the last quarter and not allowing them to um, play that junk time ball, even though the game was ba the game was dead by that point. So yeah, really liking Wanganeem Malira. I'm going to give it a couple weeks, but he is on the upgrade potential as um, Doherty's out, Sicily is in a hor horror roll, Sinclair is going to drop in price massively, and I don't necessarily know if he's going to be able to return to the 100. Let me just look at this basically t to tell you what I'm looking at here for defenders. Defenders, um, if we go to t -t -t average, I would say. Um, so you got Luke Ryan. I don't think Luke Ryan with the injuries is going to sustain a one two five. If I just blow this up for you, uh, McGrath's not going to sustain that. Wanganui Miller one hundred three. Stephen May one hundred. Um, so you're sort of looking at these guys, and then you have Nick Dacos ninety eight point three now through three games. Um, I think overall the season he's going to average one hundred and ten. But um, at the moment, he's going to drop massively. But he is a plan for Elliot Yo. if I have Nick Martin back there as well. Um, and then I basically just have, obviously, one of the, these two are going to combine into one guy. And it's either probably going to do Wanganin Malira or Luke Ryan at this point in time. And I'm really, that's why I'm just like, we have five more games or so till that point becomes a reality where Zach Jones and Caulfield or... The, the rookie that Caulfield turns into and Howes or Marty Hoare turn into the um, Wangadine Malira or Luke Ryan. Um, and there's no real defenders here that I'm looking at and liking the look of. So, um, uh, yeah, so Wangadine Malira is on the watch list now. Still, what a guy this was. I mean, the first quarter he had, what did he have here? One, uh, two, three, four, five, six tackles in the first quarter. If he was less handball happy until three quarter time, this could have easily been a one twenty five. And yeah, still just looks back to his best. And he even had a dead second and third quarter. So yeah, I'm really really happy with Steele in the last quarter when the going got tough and they needed to seal the game off. He was the one here doing all of the damage. Look at that in the first ten minutes. He got in the first ten minutes of the quarter. He had six ten. He had thirty five points in the first ten minutes of the quarter. That is crazy efficiency, I guess, and also just crazy, um, he just went off and went nuts, and he got up to a 110 really, really quickly, and then obviously I think had a break in this time, I think he was off in the last quarter, but yeah, really, really happy with that, and really um, disappointed that I didn't have him in uh, Supercoach, because he went 120, but yeah, really happy that I got him a 120 in uh, Fantasy, which is really, really good. Um, next up, Battle. I don't think he's really going to have games like this too often. So I think the... Because um, if you look at, I believe, height-wise, I believe he's taller than um, 
than the likes of a Bonner. So I think this will this is what I sort of expect Bonner to get back to when the um in more games. I mean, who do they play next week? Let me just check who they play next week. Um, they've got Essen next week. I expect Bonner to be able to um, step it up next week. So, yeah, I'm not too worried about that necessarily. Um, and I think that this is a one-off for Battle, given that, uh, what's he actually averaging Battle? Battle is averaging 76.5 on the year, which just shows his lower 53 and a higher 100. I don't expect him to necessarily be able to replicate that regularly. So I think those points will generally go to Bonner, which sees Bonner go back up to an 80, 90 or so on regular days. Um, Bayern's 99, he was really good in his 50th, the better 50th out of all the games here. Um, and then you have Owens was really good, but not really relevant fancy wise. King, not relevant. Ma uh, Ross, not relevant. Uh, Marshall, 86, had like 13 hitouts um, and, and a couple free kicks against, it looks like. Uh, let's actually check how many free kicks against. But this was always going to happen with um, Marshall, I think. The rough matchup of Collingwood is one of the toughest. And if you look at that, you look and think about Marshall. He went 118, so he was minus, on his usual average, he was minus 32 on Collingwood. And we saw Brody Grundy go um, 53. So does that mean that Brody Grundy should regularly average 85? Um, and, and we also saw, bro um, you see, uh, four free kicks and three free kicks again. So Brody Grundy probably has a potential for even more growth. So that's why I'm not even worried about Grundy as much because Marshall absolutely copped it against um, against Collingwood. And I think even though Essendon is almost as tough, I think it will be a little bit easier for Grundy, to be honest with you. Um, Windy, 83, he looked really good in the midfield. Um, he potentially is an upgrade, uh, is a potential target if you need to go up from the likes of a Caulfield, but we'll give Caulfield another week and see how that is, as Windy did, is priced at 568, so I think you can, um, go up from him, but I don't know whether he has necessarily that game that to get those 100 scores that will really help his break even. Sinclair, getting back into it, he's going to drop massively in price now. Um, I believe somewhere around that, what's that, 34? So he'll probably go down 25K, uh, down to 897, plus have about a 130 break even. So yeah, um, Sinclair will probably drop to 850K in the end um, over the next two to three weeks, but we'll see and monitor that as he surely will pick up his game again and get towards those 100s, but it seemed like he was easing back into it. Uh, Wilkin, Hig uh, Wilkie, Higgins, Hill, Henry. Henry looks injured as well, so another winger down. So that means that they're probably going to go Zach Jones, Philippou, um Well, Philippou not really a winger. Wilson probably gets a better role rather than half forward. So yeah, I'm, I, I think this could actually help Wilson in this cash generation. Is he on to the wing rather than half forward, where he generally can pick up another two to three marks. Um, so that should help him. Bonner, 61. Um, yeah, it sucks in the end, but look at this. <laughs> He basically played two quarters and got a 61. So, uh, yeah, not too worried about that. Um, in the end, you're going to have down games, and it's not one that you're going to immediately trade Bonner out because of this. I think his role was fine. I think, yeah, so I'm not too worried. Uh, Membry, Wilson, 57, good catch, Jenner, 33 here. So just showing that I think with a wing role, he'll do slightly better. And no goals um, and a behind, I believe, to get to a 57 is actually a good thing, I feel like, rather than the 63 I think he scored with two goals. So it shows that he can score outside of it. But I think it shows that as a winger, even in the St. Kilda system, which generally helps wingers out a lot more, he is probably going to be capped in that low 60 range um, average across the year. And we just need some spike games from him in, in the next couple of weeks. Sharman Jones came on very early because of Mason Wood, who's done his collarbone and a concussion. So that looks, what, four to six, I believe, a collarbone is. Um, so that will be interesting to see the makeup of the side, given it's two wingers that have gone down. And Brad Hill apparently has the um, injury icon there. I don't know about Brad Hill if he has an injury. Um, and then Stocker, Philippou. Philippou, again, just not breaking out yet. Um, then we move over to Collingwood. Josh Dacos, the only one that really actually tried, it looked like, to be honest with you. 31 to 26, 14, 32. They just look, they are not accountable for their man at the moment. And that is the biggest problem. And that really is a problem um, of, of mindset. And that can reek through. And that can take a, a couple months to fix almost. So, um, yeah, they look down and out. And top four is basically killed off for um, Collingwood. They need to win 17 of their last 20 games to get top four, I believe. 
and or 16 of their last 20 and they still have to play they still have to play Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane they have to play Brisbane twice, Melbourne and Sydney so they still have four at least four tough games alongside I don't know if they play GWS again like let's just look at the Collingwood fixture um again and you'll see exactly what I mean by that they're struggling that they really are struggling uh if we go here by price quickly I don't want this video going too long and then we go to fixture list you'll see they still have port um they still have one two three um four uh, five, six, seven, eight tough games to go, and they can only really, for top four, lose three or four of them out of the eight games. And especially if you start losing all your tough games, it becomes increasingly more difficult to qualify for top four because um, you're giving the other teams around you tough um, wins. If you give Swans two wins against Collingwood, well, they're most likely going to pick up those easy wins against or the wins against North Melbourne or West Coast, etc., and Richmond around them. So that means that they're already two games ahead of you. So the two games, you have to pick up two games somewhere, uh, which becomes increasingly harder. So it's almost like the more you lose to the teams around you, the harder it, um, the bar goes progressively higher to get to that top four. And so, yeah, I think it's something like a 18 or 20% chance that they get... Um, I think it's even 18% or 20% chance they make finals from 0-3, let alone top four. Lipinski, Cameron, Pendlebury, Elliott, Crisp, Mitchell looked actually all right in the first little bit, but fell away. I think he's still nursing something. Uh, my, uh, Maynard, Majacek, Moore, Cox, uh, McGuinness looked all right for a 64. Could be a, uh, no, a 285k, just looked. He's not going to be a forward target. And Nick Dacos... This was good to see as a Nick Dacos um, non-owner that he went and only scored a 61, and that included quite a lot of junk time stuff in 6, 8, 11, 13 points in junk time, and he still couldn't get up to anything um, uh, substantial. And that 61 basically knocks off the 61 from uh, Bonner, and it means that realistically he may only burn you um 30 or so points say you have an eight well basically look at it like this basically take your lowest score um in your best day team when it comes to weekend and take your and take nick day cost as a 110 and um that'll be the difference between what you actually burnt from nick day cost having a game like this it could be anywhere up to uh, up to 50 points i think it will land around that 40 point burn um, as I think the lower score will be your uh, will be a seventy in your best day ten. I think a, a couple of rookies will pop, but um, to have that uh, sixty one also in your system, it really doesn't help his cat well his ca cash holding I guess as he's going to drop I believe roughly thirty eight to thirty nine k, I think or maybe thirty seven k, um, and have a one forty break even and a thirty seven k drop will see him drop to nine sixty. And remember, you bought him at 982, 960 with 150 break even. That will be tough for him to match next week. So I wonder if he's going to drop even further. And we may be able to pick him up post buy, those people that don't have him, for roughly 930, 920, 910, somewhere around, somewhere around that region, especially if he gets tagged again by McGuinness. And then you have Drew on him as well. I may just pick him up post buy out. Um, just because it's best 18, and even against Drew, I think he could still pull a 110, 120. That would be better than an Elliot Yo. Um, so yeah, that that's what I may do. It may be a maneuver to get him in, just to get well, not guarantee points, but just later on in the um, in round six, to Elliot Yo may score 80, and to just grab him off the bench, um, Nick Dacos. I can basically get a projected 30 points uh, gain on field. Uh, which I think would be better than, I think, all the, the rookies, etc. Because um, it gives another week for rookies to gain cash to be able to make those manoeuvres, because I don't think the rookies will be ready to pop yet um, up to any premiums, unless there's a fallen premium, etc. Um, that roll returns um, and whatnot. So then we go bottom, going down further, Schultz, side bottom, McCreary, Quainor, Frampton, Hill, How, um, How to Goey. Again, like we said, I remember in pre-season saying, to go as an impact player, he's going to have a game like a 60. No, he had a 28. And this is why, and I think this in, almost encompasses the whole of Collingwood at the moment. 
is that their star players aren't living up to it. And, um, yeah, this was just a shocker of a game by Dugowie, considering that in red time he had, um, what's it now, five, only five points in red time, it looks like, actually here. But he actually got off to a really good start, got to 14 very quickly, and you're thinking, oh, yeah, this is good, and had 14 for the rest of the game. So that just shows you, I think, um, how much, I guess, in, he had a minus two last quarter. Um, so, yeah, it just shows you Dugowie is going to have games like this, but um, never pick impact players unless they're um, unless they're like Harley Reid and they're a rookie price player because impact players do not scale well in AFL fantasy. This is why someone put um, Nick Blakey in the in their side and I was like, don't go Nick Blakey even though it looks like it because in in the end he is an impact player and he's gonna he's gonna have games where he scores 100, but he's also gonna have games where he scores 60 and you need a player. Um, that just racks up the pill. That is the way fantasy is at the moment. Um, and if you want an impact, if you want to be able to pick impact players, you go to the super coach. But that is pretty much the video there going through the St Kilda Collingwood game. Hopefully, this gets uploaded at ten so that ten a.m. so that you guys can see it. If not, maybe eleven a.m. Um, and then that will get you guys through to um, the game tonight. Um, who is even playing tonight? It is um, Adelaide Geelong, which should be a really good game. And then we have the Saturday fixtures. We got um, three Saturday fixtures and then three Sunday fixtures. It looks like so. Yeah, a pretty um, pr a pretty slow weekend. It's going to be with only three and three, but at least it looks like there's going to be little to no clashes, which is a good thing. Yeah, no clashes. It looks like. So yeah, anyway, I will see you guys in the next video, which will be the Adelaide Geelong recap, which will come out tomorrow around the same time. Thanks, guys. Goodbye.